welcome you back to the second part of the Jan Ratio Democracy Award workshop. And uh, welcome to all of those who have just joined us now for this session. Welcome to the Wilson Center uh, and the, the Ratio Democracy Workshop. We greatly appreciate the strong interest and turnout today. I'm sure there'll be a few more people trickling in, um, but time is limited, so I'd like to get um, this show on the road. Um, let me, though, before I uh, do that, recognize two people. Um, Indre Ratsu, who I uh, mentioned and uh, recognized and thanked at the beginning. Uh, Indre, uh, wave your hand. So uh, thank you for uh, your support of this award and this workshop. Uh, and also, I'd like to uh, welcome back to the center one of our former Jan Ratio Democracy lecturers, Anatoly Mikhailov from Belarus. Uh, it's great to have him here as well. <laughs> this next session will feature this year's Jan Ratio Democracy Award recipient, Oleg Koslovsky, with a keynote on democracies, new tools for the struggle. His talk will be followed by brief comments by three, possibly just two, distinguished panelists. Dan Baer, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Robert Guerra, who directs the Internet Freedom Project at Freedom House. And Saad Irin Ibrahim, one of Egypt's leading democracy activists and a recipient of the 2006 Jan Ratio Democracy Award, among many other awards. Dan, who uh, uh, I will just introduce a little bit, even though he's not here yet. Dan was here just a few weeks ago for an important meeting on strategies to fight discrimination with reports from frontline activists in Europe and Africa. We all appreciate the work that he is doing, and it will be great to have him back if, in fact, he will join us. Uh, in time. Robert is one of the leading experts on the subject of fighting against online repression. I think we'll have a lot to add to the discussion this afternoon. And of course, it's a privilege to welcome back our good friend and Wilson Center and Ratsu Democracy Lecture alumnus, Saad Ibrahim, whose work has been inspiration, an inspiration to many of us. Let me refer to uh, you to the biographical handouts uh, for further information on the long and accomplished um, uh, CVs of our panelists. Let me just thank all of them the moment for being here with us today. I already briefly introduced Oleg Kozlovsky in the earlier session. In some ways, Oleg does not need an introduction. When I called around in preparation for this workshop to invite speakers, the most frequent response was, oh yes, I know Oleg, sure, I'll be there. <laughs> At age 26, Oleg Kozlovsky has a most accomplished vitae as a committed human rights and democracy activist. He joined Amnesty International in 2000 at the age of 15 and later became its Moscow press secretary. In July 2004, he founded and became co-chairman, later chairman, of the Moscow Association of Committee of 2008 Supporters. He organized public demonstrations in Moscow in support of the Orange Revolution in November 2004. In March 2005, Oleg was one of the co-founders of Oborona Defense Youth Movement and was elected as its coordinator that June. He served, he has served in that capacity for the past five years. Oborona's declared goal is to establish democratic, a democratic political system in Russia. One of the sharpest critics of the Putin government, Oborona features a clenched fist as its logo and uses, uses nonviolent resistance to oppose the authoritarianism in the country. Oleg himself has repeatedly spoken out against violent protest. For example, he expressed skepticism about the recent violent riots in Kyr Kyrgyzstan. By letting the protests turn violent, the opposition, Oleg <laughs> argued, 
has seeded hopes for another color revolution in a post-Soviet country. Rocks and AK-47s are bad tools for building democracy. Oleg Kozlovsky has helped to organize a number of nonviolent actions and rallies in defense of democracy and human rights in Russia. He has been one of the organizers of the dissenters marches, some of Russia's biggest protest rallies. Of course, Oleg's, ah, very good, sorry. Mm -hmm. Glad you can join us, Dan. Um, Oleg's activities, of course, didn't remain unnoticed, didn't go unnoticed by the Kremlin. The official youth side of the United Russia Party called him a wolf in sheep's clothing and declared that he had joined a rat pack called Amnesty International, <laughs> which is known for its furious support for different kinds of separatists convicts by Russian court spies, as well as uh, different petty criminals. Oleg has been arrested and detained numerous times. His apartment, which Oborona was using for gatherings and store and literature, was stormed by the police in March 2008. He and about 10 other activists were beaten and arrested. The apartment's owners were later forced by the police to speak to break the rent contract. He was conscripted illegally into the army for the duration of the 2008 presidential election campaign and released only after an international civic campaign of support. During his latest detention, he was recognized as a prisoner of conscience by Amnesty International. Oleg was, has also supported nonviolent protests in Belarus, Ukraine, and Moldova. In March two th 2006, he participated in the Jeans Revolution in Minsk, a protest against the rigged presidential elections in Belarus. He was arrested during the crackdown on the opposition's tent camp and spent 15 days in jail on Christina Street and was included in the list of people who pose a, a threat to the national security of the Republic of Belarus was banned from entering the country for one year. This past April, he was back in Minsk and he and other two other coordinators of Oborona, Maria and Alexei Kazakovs were arrested as they were leaving headquarters of an opposition party, the Belarusian People's Front. As Oleg tells it, a van stopped next to us, half a dozen of Spetnaz troops, troops put us into a van and left. Our friends and other eyewitnesses say it looked more like a kidnapping than an arrest. Oleg co-founded the Solidarnost United Democratic Movement and served as a member of the executive committee of the Other Russia Coalition from 2007 to 2009 and as co-chairman of the Youth Union of the Union of Right Forces, SPS, from 2006 to 2007. He resigned and left SPS in April 2007 in protest against the party's leadership's overly accommodating attitude towards the Kremlin. He graduated from the Department of Computational Mathematics and Cybernetics at Moscow State University in 2006. In 2008, despite all the pressures, he received a master's in political science from the Higher School of Economics. And he's currently working on his PhD in political science, a topic he knows well, nonviolent political conflicts like velvet and colored revolutions. Currently, Oleg is the executive director of the Vision of Tomorrow Foundation and an analyst with the Anti-Corruption Policy Lab at the Higher School of Economics in Moscow. His writings have been published in Russian and international media, including the Washington Post. In 2008, he received a Human Rights Award from Human Rights First, and he participated in the 2010 Human Rights Summit. These tremendous accomplishments would go to anybody's head, but you'll find Oleg to be a very modest and dedicated person, and it's been just wonderful to have him here at the center for the past few weeks, and we'll have him here for a couple more weeks. Oleg resigned from his position at Oborona last month, explaining that I want to help new leaders with fresh ideas emerge in the group. Russian opposition badly needs new faces, and I don't want to stand in their way. Ladies and gentlemen, many parts of the world, of this world, not just Russia, face and will continue to face awesome, sometimes seemingly overwhelming challenges in developing democratic governance. These challenges may seem less daunting, less daunting if we consider them from the inspiring perspective of a single brave voice, such as Oleg's, 
It's my distinct honor to introduce Oleg Kozlovsky. Oleg. Thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all the people and institutions that made uh, this workshop possible. Uh, the Radio Foundation and Woodrow Wilson Center gave me this opportunity to share my ideas with and to learn from uh, this uh, extraordinary audience uh, and uh, with the other speakers. I want especially to thank uh, Indre and Nikolai Ratu, uh, Dr. Elot Sorel, uh, Ramona Mitrika, Christian Osterman, uh, Marcia Montano, and all staff of uh, Woodrow Wilson Center. The story of life of uh, Ion Ratsu, uh, after whom this workshop is named, is both tragic and inspiring. He had to seek political asylum uh, from the pro-Nazi dictatorship uh, established in Romania uh, when he was younger than me. And uh, Mike McFall said that uh, I was a kid and I am a kid. Uh, and uh, Ion Ratsu was uh, even younger than that. Uh, and he remained in exile uh, for half a century. Still, he never gave up his work uh, for eventual liberation of his motherland. It is difficult to imagine how much persistence, patriotism, uh, and faith uh, is required. It required for him to uh, continue his quest through all this time. After Romania ultimately set itself free from totalitarianism, uh, Ion Ratu was lucky enough not only to be able to return to his home country, but also to contribute uh, to its restoration and reintegration into democratic world. This, this example is inspiration to so many people around the world who never stop believing that democracy is achievable uh, in their countries, including my own country, Russia. The last decades saw Russia's democracy, however, weak and flawed, it had been destroyed uh, by power, thirst and corrupt uh, state security officers who were brought to power, uh, who were brought to power with, with Vladimir Putin. This downfall initially met barely any resistance from uh, the citizens tired of instability, insecurity and reforms. Too few people realized that it is much easier to give uh, away your liberty than it is to reclaim it later. In 2000, still a high school student like uh, Christian mentioned, I almost accidentally found the website of Amnesty International. Then I located Moscow Group's page and clicked the join link. <laughs> this is how I became activist. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have to admit that new technologies uh, influenced me more than I influenced new technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I believe that defending human rights was a way to make my country uh, free and more democratic. And I think Ion Ratsu, who was uh, campaigning for democracy all his life, uh, must have somewhat, uh, must have had somewhat the same idea as he was also a friend of Peter Benenson, uh, the founder of Amnesty International. <coughs> Meanwhile, things were getting worse. Uh, the Kremlin took over all national TV channels, party system elections, and the judiciary were more and more controlled. All political and economical power was becoming more centralized. A euphemism of managed democracy and later sovereign democracy was coined to describe the new status quo uh, after this slow authoritarian coup d'etat. I realized that the main battle for freedom in Russia was taking place in the political sphere. So I joined SPS, Union of Right Forces, a democratic liberal in the European sense political party. The tradition of those years uh, was for leadership uh, of all so-called opposition parties, including SPS, to engage in secret talks with the presidential administration uh, before each national election. The parties promised to behave properly, for example, not to attack Vladimir Putin in their campaigns, and in exchange they could hope uh, to be allowed to make it to the parliament. Uh, oftentimes, even lists of uh, their candidates had to get clearance uh, from Vladislav Surkov, the great cardinal of Putin's domestic policy. Although this undemocratic and degrading procedure 
has never been officially acknowledged, everybody knew it existed. Party's leaders didn't know how to campaign without privileged access to funding and television, uh, so they used all their uh, authority to enforce um, these secret agreements uh, in their parties. Those who did not comply uh, had to leave the parties, like I eventually did in 2007. Interestingly enough, even these agreements didn't help SPS, uh, either due to their own mismanagement or because the Kremlin violated its part. Anyway, SPS lost its 2003 elections and so did Yablka, the other Democratic Party, for the first time since uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, leaving the parliament without any democratic factions altogether. By 2005, out opposition political parties had discredited themselves. They lost all remains of their morale. Self-preservation became the main motivation uh, for their leadership and staff. They brought themselves into that dead end by pretending to be in their position to the authoritarian regime while not daring to speak openly about it. Uh, I recall how uh, the SPS spokesman was striking all mentions of Vladimir Putin out of a press release uh, that I had prepared in 2004. And he explained, Putin has 70% uh, approval rating and we only have 3%. We will criticize him when it becomes vice versa. No surprise that um, SPS failed to receive even 1% uh, in next elections and dissolved in 2008. Since old parties uh, couldn't stand uh, in defense of democracy anymore, I, uh, together with other democratic activists, began to look for different ways. In uh, March 2005, we founded Obrona, a nonpartisan youth movement that declared uh, defense of democratic principles of the Russian Constitution by nonviolent means uh, as its main goal. In fact, the very word Obrona means defense in Russian. Uh, Obrona was different from everything uh, we had in Russia at that time. Firstly, it was independent of any parties or politicians. Obrona would not participate in elections or support anybody. It also rejected uh, any control or interference from outside because then we would be driven into the same dead end uh, where the old parties found themselves. Secondly, Obrona was very direct and outspoken in its criticism. It wasn't afraid to call a spade a spade or for that matter to call Putin responsible for destroying Russia's democracy. It was something unseen uh, in the democratic movement of that time. It made Operona look appealing to many, while at the same time some of our uh, former colleagues considered us stupid kids who couldn't understand the dialectics of politics. Anyway, five, five years later, SPS is dissolved, but Operona leaves, and its revolutionary or rebellious slogans have been adopted uh, by the whole or the majority of democratic movement. If nothing else, Obrona deserves credit for daring to say that the emperor has nothing at all, on at all. Since its foundation, Obrona had uh, been particularly active in street protests, trying to mobilize people, especially the youth, uh, to push for their rights. Indeed, it is not a secret that the very creation of Obrona was inspired uh, by the Orange Revolution uh, that brought hundreds of thousands to Maidan in Kiev in 2004. In addition to our outdoor activity, Obrona was a real uh, experimental lab uh, for all sorts of new technologies and tools to be used in the struggle uh, for democracy. Many of the ideas that I am going to share today were bro born or tested in Obrona. Two months ago, I ended my active participation in the movement, but I'm still trying to keep track of what is going on there. The new political language uh, introduced by Obrona was used by other groups uh, most importantly uh, by Solidarnost, that is Solidarity. Uh, founded two years ago, uh, Solidarnost uh, became the largest uh, democratic movement in Russia. It has been organizing campaigns and protests, publishing books, uh, participating in elections, and now even plans to challenge the Surkov's managed democracy by creating a new political party. Second of all powerful Moscow mayor Yuri Lushkov was to some extent uh, the result of uh, Solidarnost's year-long campaign. Now Solidarnost is considering uh, joining forces with the other democratic groups, 
uh, on the eve of parliamentary and presidential elections in an attempt to ruin the Kremlin's plan to quietly reproduce, replicate the system. Although the Russian uh, democratic movement has become <laughs> more solid, uh, experienced and self-confident co since 2004, some very serious systemic problem uh, must be solved. There has been almost no flow of new faces, new leaders since early 2000s uh, when Putin established strict control over television. Uh, lack of strategic vision both among leaders and activists causes apathy and disorientation within the movement. Uh, a lot of people lose enthusiasm uh, and kit, uh, while others get so desperate that they begin uh, considering violent uh, options. Incompetence and irresponsibility become a norm. So level of people's dissatisfaction with the government may only be compared to dis dissatisfaction with their position. Uh, and demand for a new generation of civil society activists is obvious, but supply is low. Uh, almost non-existent. It will take years uh, for new leaders of the movement to appear and grow up, to learn and become known. I see the task of identifying and helping them as one of the most important challenges in today's Russia. These new leaders will need new tools for their work. Uh, and I think uh, this is also something that Mike McFall mentioned, th uh, the what he calls uh, modernization of the civil society. And um, this is uh, a very vital task. And when we speak of new technologies, uh, we usually mean information and communication technology, or ICT. But in fact, there is more uh, to new technologies than that. It includes new forms of management, different organizational structures, more sophisticated approaches to planning uh, and to crafting messages, and so on. There is a lot to learn. However, ICT, uh, and more specifically the internet, have undoubtedly uh, become the biggest discovery uh, of the last decade. Their unique traits have changed the struggle for democracy in Russia. Firstly, the biggest advantage of the new media over the old television, newspapers and so on, is that it is a two-way street. In other words, in the internet a monologue is replaced by a dialogue. You cannot control all content all content or all content uh, creators anymore. Lie is exposed, truth is harder to hide. When in August this, t this year, United Russia Party decided to organize a propaganda campaign in the internet around forest fires. They didn't expect it to backfire. A blogger, uh, Valery Nazarov, more known by his nickname Pilgrim67, found that they were using Photoshop visual effects to make up photos of the heroic ex activists uh, extinguishing forests. When a few days later, United Russia published a new photo report on how the youth leaders were fighting fire, the same bloggers, blogger uh, discovered that uh, there had been no forest fires in that place. The scandal was so big that, uh, that uh, those top officers of United Russia's youth branch, Youth Guard, uh, were sacked, uh, and United Russia even claimed at some point that it would stop uh, its propaganda activities on the internet outside their w own website, where they could control everything. Uh, anything like this would be unthinkable um, on television or other conventional media, since they are tightly controlled. Although internet is still unavailable luxury for many Russians, it is clearly the most affordable and uh, democratic means to make one's voice heard. It would be impossible to mention all the issues, uh, people and organizations that we learned about thanks to new media. One year ago, a police officer uh, from Novorossiysk, Alexei Demovsky, uh, published a video address to Vladimir Putin on YouTube complaining about widespread corruption and abuse of authority uh, in the police system. Completely unknown to the public, he quickly became almost a nation of celebrity uh, when approximately one million people watched uh, their original address. Following his suit, whistleblowers uh, from other institutions, including prosecutors, officers, local administrations, other police units, began publishing their own addresses, revealing the scale and severity of corruption in the country's uh, public service. Together with other civil activities, both online and offline, it made the government react. A police reform was started with the goal 
at least the declared goal to stop corruption and decay uh, in the police system. The new law on police introduced by Dmitry Medvedev has several provisions of that sort, but it also forbids officers to publicly criticize the situation in their units or the agency as a whole. Um, one of the key concepts of the new media is crowdsourcing or delegating a job to undefined large group of people. This technology is perfect for civil society, not only because it lets underfunded NGOs perform highly complicated tasks, but also because it creates and sustains communities of active citizens around certain issues, uh, something necessary for a democracy to function. In recent years, we have a lot of actions and campaigns crowd crowdsourced online. For instance, a morning for victims of uh, March 29 terrorist attack in Moscow was organized by several Twitter users, and within hours of the tragedy, hundreds of people came to mourn those killed uh, and to demand an investigation. A few weeks ago, uh, Twitter was used to organize and coordinate uh, a campaign in support of journalist Alek Kashin, uh, who had been beaten severely in Moscow. While United Russia was trying to use old Soviet propaganda tools to score some points on forest fires, other people designed a project called Karta Pomeshi, uh, or Map of Help, uh, located at www.russianfires.ru. Uh, they were gathering reports of forest fires from people all over the country and putting this information on a map, uh, and the map was available online. They were also contacting volunteers from nearby regions who would fight those fires. Uh, then they began coordinating aid uh, to those who remained homeless because of the disaster. The project was prepared in a few days by several dedicated activists. Another crowdsourcing project, Spik.info, gathers information on police and FSB officers and other public servants uh, who participate in political repression. Uh, Speaking for runs an open online database of more than 500 such officials with detailed descriptions of what they have done. The authors of the site say that they want to break the sense of immunity that th these people uh, have by exposing their misdeeds. They also believe that one day uh, this database will help illustrate those responsible for human rights abuse uh, under the current regime. Uh, new digital technologies make it possible for a faster, almost instant, proliferation of information. New media together with mobile phones lets anybody organize live webcasts, not only from indoor meetings, uh, but from anywhere. Such webcasts are done via Twitter, blogs, uh, or video broadcasting services like kick.com. Hundreds, th hundreds and thousands of people, uh, not yet hundreds of thousands, uh, from over all over the country can follow uh, important political and social events uh, as they unfold. It is especially important in cases when urgent action is needed, like protests where a lot of people get arrested. Uh, and, well, I know what I'm saying because uh, I usually participate in those protests. Um, protesters tweet uh, from demonstrations and then occasionally uh, from police vans and stations, uh, report police mi uh, misconduct and post photos. Now it became almost impossible for the authorities to conceal what is happening, and we think that it has contributed to reducing police violence against demonstrators. It also helps human rights activists to know exactly how many people are held and where, who needs help first, and how to distribute their uh, limited manpower. Another important implication for us is that we're less and less dependent uh, on journalists to cover our activities since we can do it ourselves. Uh, it helps us not only negate censorship, but also reduce uh, risk of police in intervention or provocations because information of planned actions often leaks uh, through journalists, unfortunately. I'm sorry uh, uh, for telling you this. Uh, one of the most notable or notorious features of the internet is that it allows people to read and post uh, content anonymously. Under repressive regimes, it helps people stay on the safe side while freely expressing their views. Uh, one of the best known anonymous authors uh, in the Russian internet is Twitter user Kremlin Russia, who mocks the official Twitter account uh, of the Russian president, originally called Kremlin Russia. Uh, they are the two highest ranked political bloggers according to Yandex. 
uh, as Kremlin Russia once said, he or she would uh, like to show his face uh, to the public, but fears to get a metal road in, the, in that face. So he or she remains anonymous uh, and quite safe, hopefully. As many other things, new technologies have their dark side too. We often rely on them uh, or believe in them more th than we should. One thing that we have learned from our experiments with these tools is that virtual activity does not equal to real life participation. To support a cause by signing an electronic petition or posting a comment in a blog is something very different from going out in the street for the same cause or even attending a safe indoor event. Uh, you may consider yourself lucky if 10 people come to your event out of uh, 1,000 uh, who signed up. Whether we like it or not, a movement cannot be entirely virtual, especially where there is no accountable government or influential conventional media. Street rallies, uh, as well as other forms of struggle like strikes and boycotts, are still the most powerful tool uh, in the hands of nonviolent protesters. One can imagine an authoritarian government ignoring even a huge uh, online campaign, but not a large real-life protest. There is another danger of overestimating the power of new technologies, something I call virtual emigration. It occurs when a person dissatisfied with the status quo res restricts his activities only to the internet because it is easier and appears safer. There are thousands and thousands of people in Russia who criticize the government very harshly uh, and complain about lack of freedom on forums and blogs and in private conversations, but they never do anything to change the situation. This may be one of the explanations why the internet is relatively free and uncensored uh, in Russia. It is better for the government to have rebellious internet and quiet streets uh, than to have all those unhappy uh, people protest. Another problem uh, that everybody is, I believe, uh, aware of uh, is that repressive regimes use the internet to gather information about their dissent and their activities. They learn about planned, ac planned actions from our emails uh, and take measures to disrupt our plans. Oftentimes activists uh, got arrested even before they made it uh, to the place of a planned protest, simply because the information leaked out over the internet. Three months ago, a spokesman for Moscow police openly admitted that they were reading communications of Obrona activists. We too often, f uh, we too often forget uh, that tools uh, so handy for us to use are also handy for the government to intercept. When I said that the new media is a two-way street, I meant it. Uh, while uh, it became possible for us to expose lies and propaganda of the regime, uh, it also gave them a new tool for manipulations and provocations. Anonymity is also a double-edged weapon, uh, as it can be used to throw in false information. And one thing that worries me with that Wiki WikiLeaks uh, story is that it gives a perfect means uh, to organize very effective and powerful provocations. Imagine somebody adding one or two professionally crafted false messages, or even words, uh, into thousands of true cables that are being published on the internet. It will be almost impossible to prove uh, that these messages or words never existed, and the outcome may be unpredictable. Some believe there is something in Russia like the China's so-called 50 centers. Uh, they are people who get paid uh, around 50 cents for posting a pro-government comment on the web. These uh, internet brigades uh, are thought to have been active in Russia for years. Whether it is true or not, the regime definitely uses the internet for its own shadowy propaganda campaigns. Earlier this year, for instance, a series of videos were published anonymously where members of the opposition and independent journalists uh, were uh, seen offering bribes uh, to traffic police and womanizing. Questions were raised about trustworthiness of these videos, but it is clear that they couldn't be filmed without participation of secret services sense of anonymity also helps people feel less responsible for what they uh, are saying or doing. It provides a fertile ground uh, for growth of real extremism, that is use of violence to achieve political ends. Unfortunately, this problem also exists uh, in Russia and is getting worse. In June this year, a group of young men in far east region of Primorye, so-called Primorye guerrillas, 
made a series of armed uh, attacks against police officers. Two or four policemen were killed, several others injured. The young men believed that they were cleansing the land uh, of the corrupt police. The group was swiftly destroyed, but their actions were and are very broadly discussed in the internet. They received a lot of words of support from internet users, even a few fan sites were created. Uh, more attacks against police followed, organized by other bodies, uh, in part as a result of this support. Internet's democratic nature also has its reverse side. Non-hierarchical network structures may be very effective in developing ideas, but not so much in their adoption or realization. I've seen it during my five years in Oberon, which is a network. When everybody decides for themselves, it is very difficult to follow a strategy and to maintain even primitive discipline. When you can't reach uh, a consensus, making a hard choice can become a tormenting uh, task, often leading to fierce conflicts and splits in the group. Extreme individualism, even egocentrism, that is somewhat a result of uh, the internet democracy, <coughs> is bad for collective actions. Internet can help us speak freely, but it is our task to learn how to listen. The new tools that are available to us thanks to technological and economical progress are already changing the Russian civil society uh, and one of its most active parts, the democratic movement. Old methods of waging political struggle are beginning to fail and both the regime and its opponents uh, are looking for something new. It is not necessary that the change will be favorable for Democrats. Those who will learn how to use these instruments more effectively will have a major advantage in the future. But it cannot substitute vision and courage, persistence and faith, uh, the traits that helped Ion Ratsu keep up his fight through half of the century. Because after all, tools are just tools. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Alec, for this um, inspiring uh, keynote, very eloquent act that will be hard to follow, but I believe our <coughs> three commentators uh, will um, be able to do so. And that uh, I'll turn first to uh, Daniel Baer, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for um, Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor. Dan, I had mentioned earlier while you uh, we're still on arrival that uh, it's good to have you back, that you were in fact just here a few weeks ago for uh, an important meeting on strategies to fight discrimination with reports from uh, frontline activists such uh, as Oleg uh, uh, from Africa and from Eastern Europe, uh, and that we all appreciate the important work that you're doing, and it's great to have you back, and with that, you have the mic. Thanks very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here. And actually, the uh, the session I was here for a few weeks ago was this year's honorees for uh, the HRF award. So, uh, following in your footsteps, um, Oleg and I actually uh, met uh, online, um, as it were, because uh, uh, Robert and I were both in Texas, and and uh, you were supposed to be in Texas, and this time it wasn't. Uh, any government restraining you, as, uh, as I recall, it was a volcano restraining you, and so we had to have you piped in by uh, uh, on the screen. So it's it's nice to be sitting in person this time with you. Um, uh, I very much appreciate um, the the broad scope of of your talk that ranged from both the political to the, the political particular uh, environment that you work in, as well as the general um, observations about uh, the internet. And I'd like to. Um, focus in on, on marrying one part where they intersected in your talk. Uh, and, and actually, I'd, I'd be interested in your further comments. Um, one of the things that has struck me as a uh, relatively amateur observer of, of, of Russia is, is this question of, um, y you said there is a, there's a um, demand for this new generation of, of activists, but not a supply. And um, one of the challenges that I see when I look at Russia is actually the, the, the supply. Um, and the supply in the face of um, what seems to be um, tremendous apathy in, in some respects. And, and this is the, the, the bargain that you talked about at the very outset, that, that in, in exchange for 
for giving up periods of instability. People uh, appeared to you to have traded away something that they didn't realize how hard it was to get back. And um, so if you take that challenge on the one hand, and then the, the, the promise that the internet does have, and yet the, the fact that you also zeroed in on there, which is that it, it's a low-cost way of engaging. And so um, the, the people who, who participate online, um, getting them to take that next step to be able to, to, to wage the costs uh, of, of in-person engagement, of, of being uh, a, a on-the-ground protest, not just an online protest. Um, I, I wonder what your analysis is in terms of what will spur that. I, 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 see, I don't see, the, I don't see the, the low cost of the internet as something that holds that back, but I, I see a second catalyst as being necessary, and I wonder how you see that, um, what, what the opportunities for that uh, are. Uh, is it okay for this to be interactive? Uh, if yeah, you yeah, wanted a more general comment, uh, that, yeah, that was what struck me about it. Go ahead and then just re respond to this directly and then we'll go. Okay, um, well, uh, I think that in po uh, regarding uh, that question is whether it is uh, uh, good or bad to have this low cost uh, option for people, I think it's both. Some people uh, would never just uh, go uh, and risk their lives, health, well-being, jobs uh, in the street and to have an opportunity for them to somehow express their position uh, is better than to have nothing. But the problem of virtual uh, virtual emigration that I'm talking about is, uh, or was talking about, is um, that a lot of people could do more, but they get satisfied when they just click uh, yes I support or post a comment and they uh, have clear conscience for the next week and a week later, then uh, they just click another button and uh, or post another comment. And uh, this is uh, a problem uh, that actually I don't know how, how to solve. Uh, I think that in general, it is still better to have this option than not to have it. But uh, we just shouldn't, uh, shouldn't mix what we have online with what we have uh, in the internet. And it's unfortunately a quite, uh, qu quite often confused m when people say that we have uh, 60,000 signatures under this petition. It means that we can register a political party with that because you only need 45,000. But when you ask those people who signed it to come, you don't have 60,000. You don't even have 6,000. You have maybe 60 people and uh, it turns out that most of those 60 people have already been activists before. So you didn't uh, really accomplish anything. Uh, and this is, this is the problem that I was talking about. Dan, would, would you mind talking a little bit about what the um, State Department administration is doing in this area, perhaps? I think that might be of interest to uh, the audience. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, well, I mean, there's a, there's a broad range of U.S. programming, not just at the State Department, but also at uh, USAID, uh, in terms of exploring the ways uh, that uh, new technologies can be useful to uh, activists and civil society members uh, of a variety of stripes. Um, with those who work on the front lines of some of the more, uh, the more in, in more challenging environments, um, we have special programs that are that are targeted at uh, making sure that they get not only the tools that they need in order to access new tools, but also um, the training and uh, the the guidance in terms of how to do so safely. Because, um, uh, as you know, it can entail great risk in certain environments. I think that one of the things that, uh, as we look at our uh, programming going forward, um, something you said at the very end is something I, I strongly agree with, which is that, you know, getting to the point where you see this not only uh, as just a tool, but you start to see this as a space, and, and you start to understand the, the way the two-way dynamic is not just um, like, a, like a telephone wire, but it's actually, that's, that's what's most democratic about it, is, is the fact that it's two-way and that it's discursive and that people can affect each other's opinions and, and that opinions evolve and that those become part of uh, the public sphere. And to the extent that um, public spheres are constrained uh, in various places, um, 
the, the way that the internet functions is particularly interesting. And frankly, that's a case where the low cost aspect isn't a hindrance. Um, it's actually, th that's where it's, it's a benefit. You're not trying to get people out and necessarily get them out into the literal town square. You're just trying to get them to participate in a town square to, to have opinions. And perhaps that's the precursor to the kind of activism that, uh, that, that you're talking about. But um, in general, the State Department has a broad range of programs that range from technology to the kind of people-to-people -people, uh, challenges in this space. Okay, well, let's turn to Robert Gurra then uh, with the Internet Freedom Project at uh, Freedom House. Well, first of all, thank you very much for, for uh, inviting me to, to participate in, in this panel. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for, for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to see Oleg again and, and Dan as well. The last time we all met was semi-virtually, semi-in-person. I've had the, the pleasure of meeting Oleg both at the Human Rights Summit that we did with Human Rights First back in February, um, as well as some, some other events as well. I, I just want to uh, first uh, talk a little bit about the, the program that, that I lead at Freedom House to give a very kind of quick sense of what we do, and then I'll get into some of the, um, the comments that, that Oleg made and, and uh, make a couple of, qu um, I guess, questions, um, just echoing um, the use of the internet. Uh, the Internet Freedom Program is a relatively new program at Freedom House. Um, it's been around for about two and a half years now. Uh, following on the footsteps of some of the other programs at Freedom House, uh, we um, have helped set up a, a new report. Freedom House is known for its freedom, um, freedom of the world and freedom of the press report. We've started a new report called the Freedom of the Net to really assess the, uh, the enabling environment of the internet in different countries around the world, not just around censorship, but issues of um, how open the space is for companies and for democracy, but specifically how that space is being utilized by actors to push for freedom and human rights. And it changes around the world, and um, that's one aspect of our work. Um, secondly, we have a, a project that can be best described as a tactical su uh, support type, type work, um, where we work in some of the more restrictive um, environments, uh, trying to address some of the, the key needs of, of uh, activists and human rights defenders. Um, one thing that's talked a lot about is censorship, and so we have a program that uh, really tries not to work on the technological aspects, but really um, taking it really to the uh, human forms. Uh, everyone knows of, of internet censorship, everyone can read online about how to get around censorship, but then translating that into action to have people not only use the technology, but also change that so the discussion is one about censorship so people can change into a more positive and democratic policy environment around that is particularly important. So we're trying to help catalyze that moving forward. And then because we work with researchers and, and activists, um, then also do um, what I would call kind of some um, activism to try to, to share that with uh, folks uh, in different uh, forums um, and also track some of the, the internet policy issues uh, at a global sphere to make sure that issues of human rights um, and freedom of expression um, are, are there. So with that said, I just want to get into some of the comments um, that, that, that Oleg mentioned. First of all, it's, it's really curious that your engagement into the, uh, in your activities um, really started from a mouse click. And you saw a website and from there learned about uh, an international organization that you had some sympathy with and from there started your discovery and your actions. Um, and so from that, what's clear is that access to the Internet is key um, and in a form that's readable. So I'm not sure whether you saw Amnesty site in Russian or in English, but you're able to access it. And that's one of the key issues that in many parts of the world, um, citizens don't even have access to the Internet. And in some places, it's restricted. And so that's, that's a real challenge. And so where in Russia you're saying that there's Internet access, at least in some parts, and many parts of the world, um, whether it's, it's farmers, perhaps in China and other parts of the world, may not have that Internet access to be able to see what's going on, to be able to learn about other organizations, and that's, that's, a, a, that's a big challenge. Um, secondly, y you also mentioned um, a couple of things that, um, uh, that a lot of actors were using services that exist online, like YouTube and Twitter, to communicate with each other, to share what you're doing, uh, to post videos, whether for good or for bad. And so what's also important are the services that are available, where they be um, that are hosted in another country, in the case of Google services, or in the case of Russia. So it's if those services are available, if they're censored or not, and then how they're used for free expression or for human rights that are particularly uh, important. And what we see is a lot of legal challenges taking place in terms of how those companies may be held liable or not 
for posting those services in the same. Uh, so Google, for instance, if it's a, a video in Russia, um, it's a different jurisdiction, but the, the video sharing sites perhaps in Russia can come under influence of the Kremlin. Uh, maybe that, that's the same case in the, uh, in, uh, in the issue of China. And so it's important to have a very vibrant competition. So if, if different sites exist, and also the knowledge of the activist to be able to use and create maybe funny, creative, or uh, videos that make people go from um, just learning about something into action. Um, I think that's particularly important. Secondly, you also mentioned um, something that we're tracking very closely is what I call the government pushback. Um, all these technologies you've been talking about are kind of web 2.0 technologies. And I, what I say is that governments have gotten smart and they've moved from mm, physical, well-known uh, methods of repression to repression 2.0, using the social media, um, the web service themselves, um, to really, in a way, in some cases, kind of contaminate um, and in some cases or poison some of the voices of civil society. You talked of a very good example is how do we know if um, certain organizations are changing documents that may exist online to see whether they're authentic or not. And in many parts of the world, Russia and others, there's disinformation campaigns that are used by governments to destabilize civil society. And it's important that civil society know that. And in many cases, um, civil society is just happy to use the internet, but they also need to be aware of some of the risks and some of the challenges. Um, and uh, I think another thing you mentioned is the issue of kind of crowdsourcing, which is taking it one level more is taking kind of organized actors instead of working in a, in a physical space to organize a protest, they're maybe um, working together online to affect change. And we've seen this around mapping, you said, of the forest fires. Uh, it's been known for numerous other cases ar around the world, uh, election mapping and how what's happening around elections. But again, one needs the knowledge, one needs the ability, uh, the efforts of, of the State Department and many others to try to encourage and connecting those different things are, are very important. But um, to what extent does that translate into political or human rights is, is the big deal. You can map all the issues around an election, but if that then doesn't translate into democratic change, I think that's the big challenge as well, too. Uh, you mentioned the importance of anonymity, and the biggest problems is governments both here um, at home in the U.S., but in other countries, are making anonymity far harder. Um, you mentioned issues not only of emails being intercepted, but I would say that as we move to newer technologies like mobile phones, phone calls, voicemails, and SMS messages are equally being uh, intercepted and making it uh, difficult. I may be perhaps pointing a pessimistic role, and that's not my intent. I think what's important to recognize is that um, Oleg was saying that governments are moving into the space as well. So we need to be smart. We need to be creative. We need to share what's happening, perhaps um, how you're translating um, action or the apathy and maybe what other actors in other parts of the world have done or not to, to translate what I would say the online space to the offline space and making sure that happens um, and how to counter the efforts of the governments to, to influence that space. And so if there's one question that I would have is you mentioned that there's um, apathy when people are online and using their mouse clicks. Um, what will happen when we move to mobile phones? Um, are people going to be more active because now they'll be able to, with a click of a, of a button on their phone, be able to take a photo and share it with friends? Or in fact, will it be actually um, having less people being able to participate? So um, that's the new technology that everyone's talking about. Um, so I'm curious to get your sense of if whether it's, a, it's an opportunity, and if so, maybe what are some things that could be done to help uh, um, organizers like you and the younger faces in Russia to use the younger technologies for political activism and, and democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. Do you want to respond to that directly? Yeah, uh, well, I think we're just in the beginning of, uh, of this stage when mobile technologies uh, become the key, uh, the, the most uh, growing, uh, the fastest growing part of uh, information and communication technologies. So I'm quite optimistic about that. I think we are going to have more and more uh, technologies that will grow out of modern uh, smartphones or uh, other sophisticated mobile devices. Uh, and I think that in general it is going to, to help us. Uh, 
although again one has to be aware uh, of eavesdropping uh, being tracked uh, and so forth and occasionally uh, the governments have been just turning switching off um, uh, mobile cover uh, phone coverage uh, so it also brings some drawbacks with it but uh, I think that we're going to see a lot more uh, innovation in this sphere in in the next few years thank you with that let us uh, last but certainly not least turn to uh, Saad Ibrahim for some comments Saad Right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is a real pleasure and honor to be here to honor a young activist. I am the oldest on the panel, probably oldest in the audience, although I see some white-bearded fellow activists. <laughs> <coughs> I'm 72. Tomorrow I'll be 72. And Happy birthday. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, that was easy. <laughs> solicitation. He uses that line mm. once a week. Right. <laughs> but when I, and this is my second time to meet Oleg, I had the honor of giving him an award a few years ago and he was even younger mm -hmm. than now. <laughs> but when I reflect on it, the difference in age is two generations, if you take generation to be about 25 years. So there are now, he's the third generation activist compared to my generation. And <coughs> what he described about the state of affairs in Russia is almost a copy of what happens in my own country, Egypt. So there is an interesting resemblance, similarity between what goes on <coughs> in many of the autocratic regimes that are ruling both in Russia and in other parts of the world, including Egypt. When I received the Ratio Award several years ago, I challenged the, the Ratio family to carry on by spreading the message to the third world. And <laughs> rightly so, having been from a family of fighters, they responded positively and extended a invitation to several democracy activists from my region, from the Middle East, from the Arab world. Mm -hmm. And we went actually to Romania and met with many of the old activists who helped the transition in Romania from totalitarianism to democracy. And it gives me a pleasure to again connect with them on this occasion because the award is becoming now an institution, an institution that brings in like-minded Democrats, like-minded freedom fighters. And as Oleg was talking, and I remember my first confrontation with an authoritarian regime, I was about his age now. This was way back in the 60s. And as a result of that early confrontation in the 60s, I was exiled for nearly 14 years, could not go back to my own country. Uh, however, uh, luckily, I remained an activist. It's true, I grew older and probably less uh, energetic than I was then. But the very fact that here, and 72 years old, meeting a young activist in his 20s, tell me that there is an invisible bond among all activists, among all dissidents, among all democracy advocates. 
And that bond is really what enabled, let's say, fellow Iranian dissidents who fought against the mullahs in Iran when they stole the election. And the mullahs put down the internet. Immediately, Egyptian bloggers put their own uh, internets and all sites at the disposal of Iranian fellows whom they did not know. But there was this instant rapport between Egyptian activists and their Iranian colleagues. And so when I was listening to Ole, I felt that bond is now not only trans-regional, but trans-generational. And it is that thing that we should really seize on. And I take that occasion to not only uh, thank the organizers, the Wilson Center, that gave me a similar fellowship when I immediately got out of prison several years ago. So here is a center that has done its job uh, miraculously, brings back all of these activists together. I had the honor of seeing some of the Retio family here, and I want to thank them not only for the award, but also for taking the challenge I posed to them several years ago and invited fellow Democrats from my region to meet people who actually affected the transition, not only in Romania, but in all of Eastern Europe. So they brought in fellow activists from Eastern and Central Europe uh, to our camp. We camped in Romania, and it was one of the most inspiring, most of the, I would say, spiritual experiences that myself and fellow young Democrats uh, experienced. And these are the ones who went back and are fighting battles similar to what Oleg is fighting, has been fighting. Now, the challenge for us here, people who had gone through this kind of struggle, is as we see similarity between what somebody like Putin does and Mubarak, President Mubarak does, there is, again, an invisible bond of coalition, if you wish, of the autocrats. How are we going to respond to that? Could we strengthen the bonds and the network of Democrats worldwide to be able to stand up and then, if that could be worked out on occasions like this, or in a follow-up events, and again, here I call on the Rathio family, Rathio Foundation, to take that new challenge of bringing in and renewing the kind of thing that they had started doing several years ago, and to see how the, a new coalition of Democrats can stand up to the coalition of the autocrats around the world, especially in that region, which is very, very sensitive region, the Middle East, uh, my uh, region, which is southern of Russia immediately. There is a question of how to bring in people into our movement, people who believe in the cause, but who are often afraid to come out. And we tested that empirically and it made me think that there is, well, I concluded there is an 8% ratio of courage. So in any audience like this, if you ask people, should we do this? They would all say yes, <laughs> all right? How many of you are willing to come and participate? Half of them will probably raise their hands. Okay, let us start in three days from now. Three days, the number who shows up is, again, is cut down to about half. So when you take the initial figures of, let's say, 200 people in the audience, at the end, you get about 60. That was, I call, the 8% ratio of courage. At least that was the case in Egypt. I don't know what the case is in Russia. I get a feeling 
that it is not s uh, so dissimilar. And, <coughs> and I hope that we find ways uh, not only to be able to use modern technology and uh, internet, but also to get Western democracies, which have, I think in the last few years, have been smug about this. Whereas they celebrated the transition in Eastern and Central Europe 30 years ago or 25 years ago, they have now quieted down and they seem to have replaced the democracy encouragement agenda. I hate to use the word freedom agenda because many people associated it with an unpopular president. But whatever agenda it is that has to do with democracy, with freedom, uh, many Western democracies have opted to go for the expediency, interest. And some of our autocrats, Russian autocrats, Egyptian autocrats, have managed to give administration, especially the Obama administration, a trade-off formula. So Russia will trade off that it would help the US, let's say on the Iranian nuclear file. Mubarak has also deceived the Obama administration by posing that he will help on delivering a peace, on the peace process, the Arab-Israeli peace process. Well, these autocrats are very skillful very skillful in manipulating American and Western European democracies. They know that any re leader, president or prime minister, will probably stay four to eight years maximum and they will be gone. And a new batch of leaders will come and somebody who has been in power, like Mubarak, for 30 years, the longest ruler in Egypt since Ramses II. <laughs> I, so the longest, and he has become very skillful in manipulating Western democracies, including the American democracy. And we say, if he had not delivered in the peace process one inch beyond what late presidents that had did back in the late 70s and the early 80s, he had not moved one inch beyond what Sadat accomplished. So 30 years, dazzling American administration, making out of Sharm el-Sheikh a playground for who's who worldwide, and giving the, going through the motion that he will deliver, but he never does. He never <laughs> delivers. And, and yet, Western democracies have been outmaneuvered by these autocrats, by Putin, by Mubarak, and the challenge for us all, and here is what I would like to engage Oleg, Oleg, is what can we do? One, to increase the number of courageous people from 8% to let's say 16, double, 16%. Two, how to communicate with Western democracies and really tell them what's going on in major countries or key countries like Russia, like Egypt, like Syria, and how the autocrats in these countries have managed to actually uh, learn from one another and to outdo or to outmaneuver uh, Western democratic leaders. These are the challenges for us here. And I hope uh, Oleg will have some ideas uh, being younger and more energetic, I hope he will continue to lead fellow uh, Democrats, young Democrats like himself. And interestingly enough, his movement echoed another movement in Egypt with the same name. I don't think they communicated over this. We have a movement called <coughs> the Tomorrow Political Party, like Obran. And therefore, like-minded seem to think like, but now we have to find common action and common strategy for increasing the number of uh, increasing 
raising the carriage ratio in our society and also getting Western democracies to see through what these autocrats are doing and <coughs> to call them bluff. They don't deliver on anything and they will not, never deliver on Iran, either Iran or the Arab-Israeli conflict. And yet, an administration like the Obama administration seemed to have swallowed the bait and two years have been gone and we are still square one. So I hope with the discussion, with the panel, we can come up with some practical steps to move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Saad, for those brilliant remarks. Uh, it strikes me that uh, yet another function of the internet is for democracy activists in various countries to connect. Um, but Oleg, uh, uh, Saad, uh, um, put some questions to you, so I want to give you a chance to respond. Um, well, these are uh, two great questions, and I wish I knew the good answer to them. I, ju I think I have maybe a, a couple ideas. As for how to increase uh, that rate of courage, uh, one uh, version is there is no way to do it, because maybe it's just a question of biology, maybe it's just some constant popu uh, p uh, part of the population in any country. Uh, and then it could make sense to do the most with that with those eight percent. In fact, eight percent is not uh, is not little. Uh, for Russia, eight percent uh, would mean uh, more than eight million uh, grown-up citizens. Uh, and uh, in Ukraine, it was enough to have five hundred thousand people in the central square to change the government. Well, maybe they should have done something afterwards, uh, something more uh, than, <laughs> than just uh, protest uh, in Maidan for 19 days, but they still accomplished a lot. Uh, and maybe we should be thinking about how to organize those 8% better. But uh, another way of looking at it is maybe we should give the other 92% some uh, opportunities uh, to participate with less risk with less danger and this is what Daniel uh, I think was referring to because the internet gives more opportunity to those 92 percent and you can engage them in at least doing something mm -hmm. not just uh, staying at home and uh, staying idle and uh, of how to counter uh, authoritarian foreign policy and they're fooling the West um, well I think it's difficult but I guess that the clue uh, and the answer lies somewhere in the West's uh, civil society because the civil society uh, doesn't change every four years. Uh, it, uh, it And it's the only entity, I believe, in every country that is really interested in having democracy in their own land and uh, in all other countries. Uh, so. I think it would make sense for us to try and work more with civil societies of Western countries and to show why it is important to uh, promote democracy and not to trust uh, authoritarian leaders uh, and then to have the, that civil society push on their governments and uh, maybe eventually improve, improve the situation. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to open it up for, for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, if you could please wait for the microphone and identify yourself. Unless, Dan, did you want to react to... Uh, I'll, wait, uh, I'll wait until... Okay, the very good. So we'll go to the, the lady up front here. <coughs> right there, and then, and then Dita Detke. Yep. Natalia Lakiza, I'm a former Wood, Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson Center scholar. Um, first question probably to, to the um, all panel. Is democracy in Russia achievable or it's an endless process? And second to Oleg, uh, if it will be achievable uh, in your life, 
What will you do after then? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Alec, like, I think those were both both for you, really, so. Uh. Thank you. Um, well, uh, I, I'm sure that it is achievable. Well, first, I think, any, like it was said in the previous session, democracy is a struggle, and you never really achieve the perfect democracy and then just do something different, uh, because uh, you have to keep improving and uh, caring about it uh, all the time and uh, it is it is true that uh, eternal vigilance is necessary uh, to preserve uh, your liberty but if if we speak of democracy as some uh, set of institutions I, I'm sure that it is achievable and I think that uh, it could be hopefully uh, it would take hopefully uh, less than my life uh, to do that, but to improve it is uh, an endless task, really. And once we have some kind of this set of uh, institutions, well, there will be a lot of uh, options for me to choose from. And I think it's it's too early now to uh, to choose because there is still a long way uh, to go. Uh, I think maybe it would. Uh, it would be useful uh, to for me to just keep uh, promoting democracy in Russia or to help uh, activists in other countries like what uh, Saad Ibrahim said uh, that community to, f to help form this community of uh, democracy activists uh, or maybe it would make sense to try and change something in the political sphere or in public service but there are really lots of options to choose from. Thank you. Anybody else was like to respond to that, or okay? Otherwise, we'll go with uh, Dieter Detke. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, uh, Dieter Detke, Georgetown University. Um, I would like to ask the panel for some advice on how to structure and make democracy promotion from outside a little more effective. I mean, we have uh, examples of um, failure to some degree. If you look at EU democracy promotion towards the Middle East, this goes on for years and decades already. And if you look at the effect of that policy, you um, have to talk about a bitter disappointment, right? There's not much democracy visible. And, and the point was intriguing, of course, when uh, Oleg in particular talked about the internet and the use of the internet with the younger generation and how to create this network of Democrats that um, Saad uh, Idin Ibrahim talked about, um, that can be helped a lot with modern technology and the internet and all that. And yet, if you take the case of China, how effective governments are to block many of these um, activities, if you try, and I'm talking about you know, democracy promotion from outside, key is of course the Democrats on the ground that we want to help. How can we do that best and more effective than in the past and take the case of Europe and the Middle East as an example? Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to respond to that? I may maybe not want to answer the whole question, but maybe different parts of it because I'm not the, um, the expert by far, but I think um, a couple things that you touched on, I think that Oleg touched on as well is, um, you know, who is it in the society and who they should be linking with to try to inspire them uh, to be more effective. Um, I think um, I would disagree a little bit in something that Oleg was saying that touches what you're saying is not just looking to the West, but I would, and actually some of the, the work that we've been doing following in China. Yes, there's great restrictions, but there's also great creativity that's taking place in China. And a lot of times we um, overly emphasize what's happening in the West and not recognize that um, linking the democracy advocates um, or the activists in the repressive countries together and how they're getting around not just the internet but the, the restrictions that governments are putting into place I think is particularly important because the different strategies are particularly useful. So the bloggers in Egypt would help those in Iran, I think, is far more significant than bloggers in the U.S. 
Um, in the case of China, um, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult because the space is very restrictive and the, the Chinese government has really taken over the space and, and um, trying to do it. But it's just, you know, getting to that 98% is just um, recognizing that all this takes time, not wanting to have regime change immediate, but just working to make sure that if it's what is very democratic, if you look in China, is how the NGO community has worked around the HIV AIDS issue and how their elected officials and elected representatives and so bring democracy to other things they're engaged in so they see that as part of a normal context and then sh slowly work it up the system. So I think it's we have to recognize that we just really need to build up and so maybe finding, you know, I hate to say this, but issues that are m easier to work with the community and try to build up, I think, needs a multi-pronged approach. Um, and just making sure that there's a a variety of different uh, opportunities not concentrate just on on one approach uh, for China. For example, there's a lot of discussion, for example, around technology. Well, technology in the absence of helping the human factors, building the capacity of NGOs, of training and exchanges is equally as important. And if you don't have both, then both are going to fail. So I think it's just a multi-pronged approach. Um, and while we're, in, in, and I'll finish this with China, if we concentrate on the large countries that are the big targets, a lot of other countries, we have missed an opportunity. So you have a lot of issues taking place in Africa now as well. Um, they may not be as attractive for a whole bunch of geopolitical issues, but I think um, if we lose, for example, the, the big discussion that's taking place in regards to the internet is the, um, um, one of the coasts of Africa is now being lit up with the internet and having access to fiber optic. And the internet connectivity right now, the internet is open, but as the regimes um, and people will be able to do more, they'll close that space. So we have an opportunity to react. In the case of, of Russia and other countries, when there's a new opportunity, be it cell phones, let's seize that opportunity, because otherwise the government will seize it. So it's just, what's the opportunity and seizing it, um, I think is, is helpful. Um, so that's just a very quick comment from my point of view. Dan or Saad, would you like to comment? Or? Dan, go uh, ahead if you want to comment. I'm happy first. to. I'll, uh, I'll comment briefly and then, and then yeah. pitch it over to the experts. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I think um, a, a couple things. One, um, th there is a, um, a perpetual struggle that we talked about, and certainly I, I, I share your opinion that for those of us who spend our lives uh, talking about these things, we have to believe that not only is it possible for Russia to be democratic, but that it's inevitable in so, I, at some time, because that's part of kind of believing that, that that logic arises out of the moral logic that drives the other advocacy. Um, but I think the last 20 years, you know, uh, after, for a large part of the world, um, uh, opening up after the fall of the wall, and the, the kind of emergence of global civil society was a, you know, a eu euphoric moment where we thought that um, citizens would be able to, uh, with new political space, uh, be able to claim uh, democratic space, not only in the form of, of holding governments accountable, but in the, the form of shaping their, their societies at a local level, et cetera. And obviously one of the real concerning factors um, in the last 10 years has been a kind of global phenomenon, a coordination among autocrats um, to clamp down on, on that space and to clamp down on, uh, on those who are on the front lines. And so I think um, first and foremost, uh, uh, helping those on, uh, on the ground within is the most important thing. And that in entails two things. One is coordination, uh, fr from my perspective, that entails two things. One is uh, diplomatic outreach and, and not losing sight of the fact that although there will be ongoing uh, and uh, very frustrating strategic engagements on, on more uh, geopolitical military uh, issues that are short term uh, or economic issues that are short term, that the long term issue of democratic change is always on the table and is always part of our engagement. Um, and then also making sure that we are in a targeted fashion to the extent that we can, um, throwing a lifeline of support or a boost to those who are continuing um, to struggle on the ground. Uh, a couple other points. One, um, I think that uh, one of the things that we don't do well enough uh, is recognize that preventing backsliding is as valuable as, and sometimes easier than, as pushing 
the ball down the field um, at because partly because the gains lost are so hard to regain and obviously it's it's harder to to tout the success of having prevented backsliding it's not as sexy of a of a win to be able to say we didn't let the ball go f five yards back the uh, uh, backwards as as it is to say we moved it five yards forwards so there's some kind of optics reasons why we don't focus there as much as uh, as we might but I think it, it's important to to look at where gains have happened and and act quickly to shore them up and and connected with that I think um, there's a level beyond uh, saying kind of at what level is is country X in terms of on uh, you know on some metric uh, but also being really targeted about looking at for places for where change has happened and small changes often changes in one law that allow you know more space et cetera and moving quickly to take advantage of that because there's a limited window when when it frees up to register churches in a, in a particular country or when uh, land tenure reform happens and, and women are allowed to own property or, and, and, and it, it's not just, obviously if the change in the law happens and no behavior follows from it, and, and there's many reasons why people can't or aren't in a position to naturally take advantage of that, um, then, then we haven't locked in that gain. And so making sure that we're looking for opportunities where, where things are dynamic and, and, and quickly um, and in a targeted fashion moving in there. And in that respect, I mean, China is really fascinating. It's hugely dynamic. Um, there, there are tremendous opportunities for progress, notwithstanding the, the ongoing challenges. And um, Robert, as you pointed out, you know, the, the, the technology thing isn't every, I mean, the access thing isn't everything. And frankly, Russia is an interesting uh, example where access isn't that restricted and and yet um, change is still a struggle <laughs> um, and so to, to those who think that 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 access alone uh, <coughs> brings change um, that we have we have a counterfactual but I but I think there are, I, I think looking for dynamism uh, making sure we're never lo losing focus particularly in this this moment of, of taking uh, of on supporting those on the ground on the front lines thank you Sarah <coughs> well, just to add to my colleagues' uh, comments, I think one thing that Western democracies can and should do is to use recognition as a pressure uh, weapon to force those autocrats to uh, <coughs> modify their behavior if not to change it completely, at least to modify their behavior. And I am one of those who believe, of course, that democracy could not be exported or imported, but it definitely could be supported. And that is the role of Democrats around the world, both governments, states, as well as civil society. Two, that whenever Democrats ask for help, I think Western democracies should be at least willing, disposed to give that help. Thirdly, we should mobilize democratic countries in the South. Because often, and I'm sure Oleg probably uh, experienced that, the autocratic regime would taint somebody like Oleg, like myself, as being an agent of the West or an agent of foreign powers. However, they could not do that if a country like India or Indonesia or Malaysia are on board. And I think this is a challenge for us to bring in democracy, established democracies from Asia Africa, Latin America, to participate in helping the democratic movement around the world. These are ways, I think, I'd like to see if there's any resonance or if that makes any sense to somebody whom we are looking for to lead the new generation. Or Can I jump in and just um, soundly second that, that I think that actually if you're looking for macro level sh uh, shifts that could really change the landscape, um, conveying to a set of countries that it's time that, that, that they have reached a point domestically, that it's time that they show themselves to be leaders in the region 
and in the world in terms of advancing democratic principles and a set of countries that haven't historically, but that could and should do that now. Um, conveying that message is one of the most uh, important things that I think American diplomacy and Western European diplomacy can do because uh, it, it, is, it is crucially important in, in the next decades for leadership to come from a variety of corners. Great, thank you. Let me go to Indre Ratsu. Thank you all very much. I'm uh, Indre Ratsu from the Ratsu Democracy Center, one of the partners in this, uh, the organization of uh, the Jon Ratsu Democracy Lecture Series. Um, I can't resist, well, first of all, thanking you and congratulating you, Oleg. This has been most inspiring for me personally, and I think for members of my organization. And I particularly can't resist telling you, sharing with you all uh, three little stories about uh, Jon Ratsu, because I have felt um, his spirit very fr present here, uh, as you've been sharing with us. Um, and after all, this lecture, uh, workshop, series, these awards um, are inspired by him and by his life and his work, as, as you have all uh, so generously mentioned. Um, uh, number one, about communications technology, I'm very struck by that whole um, focus that you brought us today. And uh, thinking back that... Um <laughs> Jan Ratsu, at one point in, uh, I think it was like 1957, um, uh, there was a, a comment broadcast over the radio by the then uh, Hungarian Minister of Culture who said uh, something to the effect that um, we appreciate humor, but we will not tolerate jokes against socialism. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he and um, some of his friends, and I want to, and his friend was a Czech um, um, activist. Uh, uh, cooked up the idea of using uh, Jan's telex, he was in a shipping company at the, mo at the time, uh, to uh, circulate um, cartoonists in newspapers all over the world, and saying, this remark has just been made by the um, uh, Minister of uh, Culture from uh, Hungary, what do you think of it? And um, cartoons poured in from all over the world. And um, those cartoons became the first great challenge exhibition. It was opened here in Washington by none other than Richard Nixon, who was uh, vice president at the time, in London by Clement Attlee. It went all over the world. My brother and I, Nikolai, repeated the exercise um, in 1958 um, around the declaration of uh, uh, the freedom of, um, of, um, of uh, communication of words. So, uh, it, it at any time, I'm sure there are sort of interesting um, communication technologies that we can use. And uh, he was very in inventive at you know, even using something that, up to that point in, in his shipping company office, has only been used for bills of lading, say. Um, number two, um, influencing the supply of, um, of democracy activists. He was very concerned about that. And uh, our household, as a growing up as a child, uh, there was a stream of visitors, of people, people coming through. And um, he encouraged and supported, and um, he was doing quite well in business, and so he helped out wherever he could to their material needs. And um, nobody really lasted. And I used to think, well, maybe there's something to do with his personality. Um, and I suspect n actually not, in conclusion. There was an interesting case recently uh, where one of the peop p persons he had done a lot to help, um, who, uh, we can name him, his name was Silvio Crachunash, and he came out of Romania ostensibly after many years in jail, and um, uh, Jan Ratsu helped publish a book, his book, um, he um, helped him get an apartment, and um, a couple of years recently, it suddenly appeared that the whole thing was a plant and that Silvio uh, Trunash had not actually uh, escaped uh, at all and that he was a plant. And the whole story uh, came out. And he was confronted um, uh, in the media in Romania. Um, and he said, Mr. Ratsu, you, you're terribly naive, aren't you? I mean, people take you in all the time. And his answer was very significant. I mean, he said, look, I cannot live any, any other way. Uh, I have to give people the benefit of the doubt. If I, I live in fear of and suspicion of other people, I'm just like them. And uh, that, that made a big impression on me. And you 
gave me very much the same kind of uh, um, inspiration today. And lastly, um, uh, point three, um, achievable. Is democracy achievable? Um, he was asked that constantly. And uh, it, uh, we never imagined that, uh, he never imagined that he would see uh, democracy return to, or some form of democracy at any rate, return to his native Romania, let alone um, the collapse of communism um, in the, uh, throughout the Soviet Empire. And uh, one of his, well my brother, uh, or Nikolai, or myself, said to him rather brutally, I, aged about 14, 15, after a summer holiday, um, uh, Dad, uh, you're just like uh, that donkey we saw in uh, Portugal. Uh, he has a donkey out, a, a carrot in front of his nose. And he's always trying to get the carrot when he's never going to get it. And um, my father reminded me um, of that. I, I, I I don't, didn't realize what, uh, it wasn't, it was a rather rude comment by a, a teenager, as far as I was concerned. Uh, and he said, very significant <laughs> image you had. My life is exactly like that. It really doesn't matter uh, whether I get the carrot or not. It's just that I keep on <laughs> trying to get there. You <laughs> know, uh, the, the journey that, 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 that counts. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, Indre, for these very thoughtful comments. Um, yeah, I have one thing, but I'd like to impose one more. <laughs> 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 it was to Saad, because it was Saad who challenged um, uh, my, my team and I in, um, in Turda to open up the, um, what we were doing there, um, which is a, it's, a, um, it's a democracy center, to people from his part of the world, from the Middle East. And so we did so, and we shared these two very exciting democracy camps together where we build a mini democracy over a very short space of time and, 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 and experience together how difficult that is. We have not repeated it and been able to repeat it in the last two years. We've missed two years, but not for lack of candidates, but for lack of funding for travel and because of the EU, current EU visa restrictions for young people coming in from the Middle East. So my challenge to you is, I'd like to bring the Tour Democracy Camp to the desert somewhere, in one of those wonderful <laughs> um, monasteries maybe behind Alexandria. And we all go in as tourists, and <laughs> it could be very exciting. Okay, let's right. work on that. <laughs> Thank you. I have a number of people on, on the list who'd like to, to speak, and so let me call on a, a, a few people at, the, at one time now, and then give uh, Oleg and um, the other panelists a chance to respond. Um, there was a qu question here. I think you had a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, Rebecca Chamberlain, the Wilson Center. And Oleg, I, I just commend you for what you, what you do. Um, having I, I work in Moldova and knowing what some of your colleagues do in Moldova and what they've struggled with over, over the years. But what I wanted to, um, to say is that I just, I was really struck by your talk about, about with, with the challenge of these new tools and that um, on the one hand, being anonymous, say through the internet, that's something positive, that's, that's very important. But on the one hand, you also said that um, it's a, it, it, it is very much a challenge and that it's hard to get people to move to the next step in their dissension, in their protest, and, um, and wondering you know, if you can share more about that. But then the real question I wanted to ask is about, um, can you comment on, on, the real, on the reach of Solidarnost and, and your movement beyond, say, Moscow and into the, more, um, into the margins of Russia? Have you had much su success with that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. David Ottaway, over there on the right side. Uh, Dave Ottaway here at the center, too. Uh, Saad, I had a question for, for you, but it's a kind of more, raises a more general issue others might want to respond to. Um, Speak up a little, David. Uh, what struck, strikes me about Egypt is that you do have 8% courage and higher among workers who have gone out in the thousands uh, in strikes and sit-ins in front of the parliament uh, over their concrete issues of pay or being fired or whatever. So you have a lot of activism among the workers. But um, you c it's hard to mobilize people for abstract ideas of democracy. And uh, my question is, is there some way for the pro-democracy activists to 
to mobilize and make contact and use the worker discontent to promote your cause. Thank you, David. The gentleman there in the center. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm uh, Octavian Ionici from American University. And um, I just uh, want to thank the panel for all the remarks and um, also um, to make a comment. Um, it's wonderful to have all this technology, the internet, uh, Twittering and uh, uh, Facebook, um, because they create a sense of community. But in the same time, they uh, shape or reshape our opinions. Regarding democracy, I was thinking and listening to you, maybe uh, we need to create, uh, uh, specifically for Russia at this time, but for other, co other countries as well, a safety culture. And to try to bring together at the same table uh, the private sector. And, uh, you know, I was reading uh, about uh, and uh, thinking, of thinking about uh, um, a program like uh, um, Peace Through Commerce, right, in other parts of the world. Um, the NGOs, the universities, the think tanks, uh, research institutions. Um, are you uh, all familiar with any initiatives like this or any programs in Russia at this time? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, finally, and then we'll see if we have time for another round. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul Biscay, I work in international development. Uh, two quick uh, questions. One on the strategic uh, level, how do you see the future of democracy promotion uh, as a foreign policy instrument of countries who are currently cash strapped by the financial crisis? Uh, on the personal side, I mean, your type of struggle is that between two groups which you, you see soft, you, you basically address your issues through the language of soft power, but then again, the, uh, your opponents understand better the language of hard power. And on a personal level, sort of how do you cope with that when you're face to face with them? Because what you see as a sort of strength, they perceive as a weakness for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Alec, do you wanna go first? Um, okay, well, uh, first question about the reach of solidarity uh, outside Moscow. Well, we're going to have uh, a Congress of solidarity in a week and a half on December the 12th, and uh, there will be uh, repre representatives of dozens of uh, cities where Solidarnost exists. Uh, however, uh, although Solidarnost is f hopefully or perhaps uh, the most uh, successful uh, organization in uh, going beyond Moscow or beyond Sadova Rin in Moscow, uh, into the regions, uh, there is still much more to do. It's still, uh, of course, more concentrated uh, in the capital. Uh, however, Solidarnost had some successes when it uh, was the organizer or co-organizer of uh, major protests uh, in the cities of Kaliningrad, uh, Yekaterinburg, uh, Arkhangelsk, and others, uh, which sometimes uh, made uh, well m uh, made some uh, battles won for us like uh, the uh, governor of Kaliningrad was sacked uh, several months after th the huge protest uh, that Solidarnost was very active organizing uh, and still there is much more to do so I think that this is also something where internet can help because uh, it uh, makes it much cheaper and uh, easier to work uh, and to extend your network uh, into the regions when you have a uh, good command on the internet. Uh, as for bringing together, uh, I, I didn't uh, quite uh, understand what the purpose of, uh, of that uh, idea is to bring together activist business. Is it to discuss issues of democracy? Is it to achieve some practical results? and to try to achieve, you know, uh, making aware everybody yeah. and um, making aware the private sector. And the private sector has an interest in democratic uh, values as well. Uh, the not only the NGOs, not only the uh, uh, activists, not only the uh, universities. Um, I think that in general uh, this is a good idea, but my reservation, especially about uh, 
private sector and business is that they are uh, the most vulnerable, I believe, part of the Russian society. Uh, and it, the, the more successful they are, the, mo the more v uh, vulnerable they are. Uh, and most business people will not even want to be mentioned in the same list as myself or some my colleagues because they're afraid for their businesses. They could uh, discuss something in private, but uh, not publicly and certainly not in the United States, I think. Uh, so I, I want to try and address this uh, problem and to meet with some of the more uh, courageous or more advanced people uh, in the private sector. This is something that I'm trying to do. Uh, but it is a very difficult task in Russia because uh, I think Andrei Aburyanov can tell much more than uh, I uh, about property rights uh, in my country. But they, to say uh, the least, they are not secured at all. So everybody is quite, even if they share our goals and our values, they're afraid. Thank you. Dan, do you want to um, comment on this issue in particular? Or that last point? Yeah. I, I, I mean, I agree that the, the vulnerabilities uh, are, are, uh, are severe in many cases, and that makes it difficult. I think there are w a couple things. One, um, it's very clear that business has an interest in uh, good governance, certainly in, in areas, particular areas like corruption or something like that, that, that having a reliable judiciary is something that's extremely valuable uh, in terms of investment, et cetera, and so th they have an interest in that, and it, it, whether or not they're willing to speak out in, in support of particular a activists or something like that, they, they can be um, encouraged to speak to gov when they are speaking to governments to, to incur to encourage their government inter interlocutors to strengthen judiciaries, et cetera, and, and to speak about the importance of uh, rule of law and those kinds of questions. I think that um, in the realm of technology in particular, there are some, um, some positive examples uh, of businesses um, working together to, to try to uh, understand what the challenges they face are. The Global Network Initiative, which is a uh, a uh, multi-stakeholder initiative that uh, that arose basically out of the Shutao case in in China with Yahoo, um, and congressional testimony has led to uh, this this young organization where companies, uh, academics, uh, and NGOs come together to sort through the very real challenges that that technology companies face in difficult environments and figure out. Um, in practical ways, how they can address them. You know, how, how you do a human rights risk assessment before you go into a new country, et cetera. And um, I, I think you started by talking about a culture of safety, or, or uh, you mentioned that at one point. And I think that too, I mean, uh, increasingly in our own programming in this space, we are, we are focusing more and more on the fact that um, you know, a access alone isn't enough. You really have to make sure that people aren't putting themselves at risk by using these tools. And, and certainly businesses have a play a role and have played a constructive role with, w with us um, uh, in helping us understand uh, what messages we should be getting to people. And, and uh, you know, we can serve a convening function. At, and, um, you know, Google hosted a conference in, in Budapest this, this fall w that was very useful, brought together a bunch of activists. Um, to, to talk about the challenge they face in, th in that respect. So there, there are good examples uh, of that in particular in the technology space. Thank you, Saad. Do you want to uh, respond to David's uh, question about um, mobilizing the pro-democracy forces in Egypt? Right. Well, <coughs> one thing that everybody should know is that since the signing of the uh, Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty, the armed forces of Egypt has shrunk from 1 million to 300,000. However, the internal security forces, the riot police, has steadily growing. And nobody would in this audience can guess the size of the state security police now. It is one. 0.5 million. That is five times the size of the army, which indicate that the regime perceives the internal front as the imminent danger. And that's why the steady growth of the security forces, 
that will quell any, any demonstration, any march. And that is why the ability to link with the workers and to mobilize them for democracy has been extremely difficult. Not impossible, but difficult. However, we have tried with another constituency, and that is the Bedouins of Sinai. We brought them into politics, and they, in a workshop like this, actually Western Euro, I mean Eastern European uh, activists who came to our center in Cairo, and we invited workers and some Bedouins from Sinai. And they were fascinated by the methods that Eastern Europeans used to confront their regimes. They went back and they read into the clauses of the Arab, the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty that there is a no man's land that the Egyptian security could not enter. So they learned to stage demonstrations and marches in that no man's land. And the Egyptian security, brutal as they are, could not enter into that land. And on the other side, the Israeli media found that to be a bonanza for coverage. So the Bedouins managed, in fact, to force the Egyptian government to accede and to respond to their demands. Now, we may be able to get the workers to use some uh, imaginative ways to be able to stand up and to link with Democrats who are not necessarily workers and to be able to uh, avoid the brutality of the Egyptian police, Egyptian riots, uh, and the security forces, which, as I said, is huge and truly brutal. And anyone who follows the news of the election in the last few days sees how the security forces have managed to arrest, to detain, to even prevent voters from going to the voting stations if they suspect that these voters are not supporters of the ruling party. And what they would know? Because the ruling party supporters will get a special card. And if they show that card, then the security would allow them to go into the station. If they don't have that card, they would be blocked. So there are all kinds of tricks that the regime has used, and we can find ways to counter it. But of course, we would look forward to places where we can bring workers, uh, as uh, <coughs> David suggested, to learn from experiences from, let's say, the Romanian workers. So the Toda gathering that we used to have, maybe next time we should have a mix of young activists as well as workers, if you are willing to host us again. Definitely. Thank you. Thank you. We're almost out of time, but I want to give um, Robert a chance to also respond. Um, I, I wanted maybe to, to also make some comments on the, the business question. I think something that we have to realize that um, in using the internet, it's actually the businesses that run the infrastructure and run the services. And uh, if not having them part of a multi-stakeholder initiative, having good relationships with them um, can try to push them to do the right thing. You mentioned the, the recent election uh, in Egypt. Um, one thing that we tracked and we actually um, realized is that um, Facebook was a platform that was being used by a lot of the human rights movements, but also um, those involved in, in politics to mobilize around the election. And we very quickly, a week before the election, um, uh, realized that, th that the space was getting very hot. Was, was th there was a lot of conflict taking place there. And we proactively reached out to some contacts we have at Facebook. And we said, look, we're monitoring this election. It's taking place on your, on your platform of sorts. Um, this is things to watch out for. Um, they said yes, we monitored it as well, and we basically said these groups particularly are areas where um, there might be something happening. Uh, Thanksgiving Day, between 4 o'clock and 6 p.m., we start getting reports that 
some key sites on Facebook around anti-torture and election suddenly become offline. But because of good relationships that are established with the contacts, we're able to realize what the problem was and fix it within four hours before the elections mm -hmm. and also before um, some other big story that's been in the media over the last few days it was able to, to, to consume and some change was done. So if anything, it's just to have that relationships and to move them in the right way. Um, I want to make a really quick comment. So I think it's important to have those relationships and if we don't, the companies will just do whatever and won't realize that they really need to maximize human rights online. The one question that's not answered, and I just want to make sure that it is answered, because to not answer it is, 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 is a problem, is um, what can democracies do when they don't have money? Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, not realize that it's not just money. Um, I think it's human capital. It's the convening power of governments. The fact that they can bring people together, that they can do diplomacy, um, I, I think is very, very important. Freedom and House I, wants you to say that it's about the money. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but I think, you know, it's, it's also making sure that they engage their citizens to care about human rights. Um, it's something that doesn't necessarily cost as much money, but if we have not only a government that cares, but a, a public that does as well, too, they, too, can support human rights. And if they don't do that, um, you know, so one thing that, that the U.S. could do and other governments can do is to make sure that in democracies – that citizens actually care. Because if the youth of the US and of Europe don't care about human rights, that's worse. Because then they won't support human rights abroad. And so I think that's, that's very important to track what happens at home. And so there's a lot of different ways. And so just making sure that it doesn't leave the agenda. And yes, funding is always good. But if that's not there, there's other things government can do as well. Picking up on Robert's um, last point, I just want to mention that, of course, tomorrow morning, Oleg will speak at the World, F World Youth Democracy Forum at George Washington University, hosted by Professor Sorrell. Let me, we're out of time, so I have to apologize for not uh, calling on any more speakers. This was, to me anyways, an immensely rich, fruitful discussion with lots of new ideas that I need, will need time to think about, I hope for you as well. Let me congratulate Oleg again for, uh, on the award and for a wonderful speech. Thank the panelists uh, for taking the time to be with us tonight, you all as well. I'm particularly pleased by the intergenerational bond of democracy activists that we established here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful evening. And <laughs> we'll be sending out, uh, we'll be publishing the transcript, so uh, look for the publication. Thank you.